There has been a huge backlash against the transgender community, and specifically transgender social media star Dylan Mulvaney after they got a brand deal from Bud Light. A beer is now promoting itself during March Madness, a male-oriented event, by hiring a man who says he is a woman dressed as Audrey Hepburn to sell you beer. Whether you're liberal or conservative, you probably have some strong feelings about this. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you what medical studies say about gender affirmation and transgender people, and how I, as a real doctor, a board-certified plastic surgeon, believe this whole situation with transgender children and adults should be handled. Well, this is a super hot topic, and I know people have very strong opinions about transgender topics today. And so I'm gonna try to handle it from a completely medical perspective. We're gonna hear what the medical associations recommend, and we're gonna talk about the studies that have actually looked at transgender surgery and transgender people in general. And in the end, I'm gonna go on a limb and give you my opinion of this whole thing. Did you know that only 0.7% of the population is transgender? Well, this is a relatively tiny segment of the overall population of the United States, yet it seems like this subject is in the news every single day. Well, studies show that transgender people realize that they are transgender at an average age of only 8.5 years old. However, they don't disclose their feelings until about 10 years later on average. Now, before we go any further, I think it's important for us to define two very important terms, cisgender and natal gender. You know, I think we all know what transgender means, but do you know what cisgender and natal gender means? Because I think it's important to this whole discussion. The term cisgender refers to people who identify as the gender of their birth. Natal gender refers to the sex that was assigned at birth. So, I was born a male, I identify as a male, so I'm a cisgendered male because I identify as that, and my natal gender is male. Well, something that is really concerning to me is that studies show that adolescents and adults who identify as transgender have high rates of depression, anxiety, eating disorders, self-harm, and suicide. In fact, one study found 56% of youth who identify as transgender have contemplated suicide, with 31% actually attempting suicide. Now this is compared to cisgendered, which is 20% and 11% comparatively. So think about it. One out of every three transgender youth have attempted suicide and over half have considered it. I mean, these are staggering and really, really sad numbers. Now as the parent of two high school aged children, for me to think that either of them would contemplate suicide is absolutely frightening. And I think that we can all agree that we do not want our youth, whether they're cisgender or transgender, to be in that situation and to be so down and to have such, I guess, lack of hope that they would actually consider this type of thing. Now, some people may say that transgender people have more mental illness. Therefore, they may be more likely to contemplate suicide. So is this true? Is there evidence that transgender people have more underlying mental illness than cisgendered people? Well, let's see what the experts say. According to the American Psychiatric Association, being transgender or gender variant implies no impairment in judgment, stability, reliability, or general social or vocational capabilities. However, these individuals often experience discrimination due to a lack of civil rights protections for their gender identity or expression. Such discrimination and lack of equal civil rights is damaging to the mental health of transgender and gender variant individuals. So mental health issues among transgender people are more the effect of multiple factors, including discrimination, instead of an underlying difference in the amount of mental illness compared to the cisgendered community. And this, I think, is super, super important to realize. So is it just the psychiatrists that believe this? Well, let's see what the American Academy of Pediatrics states. They state that if a mental health issue exists, it most often stems from stigma and negative experiences rather than being intrinsic to the child. So transgender people aren't born with more mental illness, and mental illness does not cause them to be transgender. Transgender people who suffer from mental health issues often have it 
due to the way they are treated in our society. Now, on top of this, youth who identify as transgender experience disproportionately high rates of homelessness, physical violence, both violence at home and violence in the community, substance abuse, and high-risk sexual behaviors. So when you take all of this into account, I think you get the picture that transgender people are facing. It's discrimination, it's ridicule, bullying, and all of that leading to a poor sense of self-worth and even mental illness that is not, I repeat, it is not a function of them being transgender. It's the result of society's lack of empathy and care for them as individuals. And studies show that this starts at home. In fact, one study looked at 433 transgender adolescents in Ontario, and they found that the suicide attempt rate was 4% when having supportive parents, and as high as 60% when parents weren't supportive. We must do better than that. So how should we treat children who are possibly transgender? Well, research shows that children who are prepubertal, meaning ages five to about 12, and they identify as transgender, they know their gender as clearly as their peers who identify as cisgender, and they benefit from the same level of social acceptance. Now, this means that these children didn't come across as confused about their gender identity, but as certain in their gender as cisgendered children. So just as, let's say, a cisgendered boy naturally identifies as a boy, a transgender boy naturally identifies as a boy. So now let's shift gears and let's talk about the actual process of transitioning. I really would like to demystify something that this whole process, I think, for a lot of people is a mystery for them and they think a lot of bad things about it. And so let's get to the nitty gritty of exactly what it is. Gender affirmation refers to the process of reflection, acceptance, and for some, intervention. Basically, the idea is to accept the person for who they are. So what is the typical course for a young person who seeks gender affirmative care? Well, first it starts with social affirmation. Now this includes adopting gender affirming hairstyles and clothing. They also start using gender affirming name and accurate pronouns. And they begin using non-binary restrooms or gender identifying restrooms. So the first part of this really is just lifestyle based. Now the next step is puberty blockers, and I know that this is a bit of a controversial subject. So let's explain what this is. Gonadotropin-releasing hormones have been used since the 1980s to prevent puberty in children who have central precocious puberty. Basically, by giving these hormones, you can slow down that pubertal process and prevent it from happening. Now they can be used in adolescence until the age of 16 to give the child and the parents and the healthcare professionals time to explore their gender identity, to develop coping skills, and to give mental health support and really overall support the family and of course define the goals of their treatment. Now if these puberty blockers are halted, then they progress naturally into puberty. Well studies show that providing puberty blockers to adolescents who identify as transgender generally leads to improved psychological functioning in the young adulthood. And really the goal is to prevent their natal gender physical pubertal changes from happening. So if somebody is a transgender girl and they're starting to go through puberty, we don't want, let's say, the Adam's apple to enlarge. We don't want the facial changes to occur to make this transgender girl to develop more as a boy or a man. And this is because these can necessitate surgery to reverse. And obviously as a surgeon, we know we don't want to perform surgery that we don't have to. Now the next step is cross sex hormone therapy. And this starts in early adolescence. So testosterone is given for female to male transgender patients and estrogen plus androgen inhibitors are given for male to female transgender patients. And these medications give the transgender person the physical characteristics of their true gender identity. So if somebody is going from male to female, being on estrogen plus androgen inhibitor hormones would let's say give the person a higher voice, maybe softer features and other traditionally female characteristics. For female to male, testosterone will make the voice deeper, it will give more facial hair and give the figure more like a traditional male figure. Now the last step in transitioning is gender affirming surgeries. Now the data is very clear that undergoing gender affirming procedures, including surgery, is very beneficial for people with gender dysphoria. 
Now, there was a survey of over 22,000 transgender people, and they found that gender-affirming surgeries were associated with a 42% reduction in psychological distress and a 44% reduction in suicidal ideation when compared with transgender and gender-diverse people who had not had gender-affirming surgery, but they wanted it. But not all transgender people get surgery. In fact, the opposite is actually true. Approximately one in four transgender people undergo surgery. So three in four do not undergo surgery. So what are the types of procedures that are performed? Well, there are a lot. And although the less invasive procedures, like injectable fillers and Botox, can be done by a plethora of trained practitioners, the actual operations should in general be performed by a real plastic surgeon who specializes in these procedures. So for example, if you're transitioning from male to female and you're considering breast augmentation, you don't want to go to any old plastic surgeon to perform this surgery because it usually must be done differently than a standard breast augmentation in a cisgendered female. So for example, the male nipple typically lies in a different place, usually a little bit lower than the female nipple, and this should be realized during the operation. Now, gender-affirming operations are separated into three basic categories. There's facial reconstructive surgery, top surgery, and bottom surgery. Top surgery and facial reconstruction surgery are usually performed first. Now, I get a lot of people who call my office for gender affirmation surgery, and I'll tell you, this is not something that I actually perform actively. And this is because I strongly believe that these operations are so specialized that only specialists should perform them. And I am not a gender affirmation surgery specialist. So when people call my office for these types of operations, I will usually refer them to specialists across the country who I trust. That being said, we do do injections in my office because I do think that these are not quite as complex and can be performed by a lot of different experts in the field. Now, what about gender affirmation surgery regret? There are people who believe that a high percentage of transgender people who undergo gender affirmation surgery regret it later. Well, the truth is a recent study revealed only a 1% incidence of surgery regret after gender affirmation surgery. Just 1%. So the belief that a high percentage of transgender people who undergo gender affirmation procedures regret them later, that is just not true. So what do I believe about gender-affirming care and specifically Dylan Mulvaney? Well, life is not easy for people who are LGBTQ. For hundreds of years, they've been discriminated against, they've been bullied, harassed, ridiculed, and pushed to believe that something is inherently wrong with them. This type of bullying and hateful behavior is so incredibly harmful, and it results in high rates of suicide, depression, and overall unhappiness. What are we doing? Well, whenever possible, we should first and foremost love each other, no matter the color of our skin, our socioeconomic status, or the gender we believe we really are. Now, if you find Dylan Mulvaney weird or annoying or an opportunist, then just don't follow her. Don't let her transition affect you then, and please focus on being nice to our fellow human beings. Now, I know I'm probably gonna lose a lot of followers for saying that, but that's okay. Life is short, my friends. Let's not spend it being mean to each other, but instead practice kindness and empathy. Now, you know, I recently reacted to a video of a young transgender man undergoing top surgery, and I think his story is very eye-opening. In the video, you follow him through his process and see his final results. Please check it out right up here where I react to it. And remember, eat real food, use clean skincare, and auto-juvenate before you operate.